Amen. Thank you, Jim. Well, good morning. Great to see you this morning. Turn to somebody next to you, give them a holy high five, and tell them how glad you are to see them this morning. Tell them how glad you are to see them in church. I mean this, listen, we do the, during the uh, greeting time, how awesome it is. One of the things about church that's so wonderful is that you get to see one another and uh, just experience some moments with friends and uh, people that you've known, maybe some new people that you get to meet, and there's something very special there. God moves through even our fellowship. There's something powerful about being together uh, in the presence of the Lord on on a Sunday morning. So it's so good to be here with you. If you are a guest, as uh, was shared by Jim, we are so, so grateful to have you here. We welcome you. And um, what I would like to do quickly is we have a, a card here with a note to the church. I'd like to share this with you. It says, Springfield Assembly family, we would like to say thank you for all the prayers, cards, texts, Texts and acts of kindness during my mom's illness and homecoming. Our support system here is incredible. We love you all. Don and Cheryl Glaze and family of Joyce Walker. Yeah, we love you, uh, Glaze family. We continue to pray with you and uh, others. And so thank you so much for the note. And I want to say, I want to reiterate what you just shared. It is, you are a wonderful family and a number, uh, a church family, number of families have gone through a time of grief and bereavement and you have been there as a family in an amazing way for them. God bless you for that and uh, this morning if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn to James chapter 1. We're continuing our series in the book of James, James 1, I'm going to talk about 100% pure Religion. So I read, a, uh, read a, an article. This is in the New York Times Magazine. Leon Kalajian, he's 82 years old. He's the founder of something called Tom's Sons International, pleating, uh, pleating as in pleats on a, a, a skirt or fabric. So Tom's Sons International, pleating, it's in Manhattan. He says this, I'm quoting. Think of this as coming out in in your best New York accent. My mother was doing pleading when I was very, very young. Every chance I get, I'm in the factory. I was six years old. I have to work. I can't stay at home. I have to do something. I have to be around people. Someday they ask you, when the pleading is not in fashion, what will you do? I do pleading. For me, it never goes out. The pleading. Every day, I can create a new style. Leon has been working in that industry, in that business, for 76 years. Not far from him, also in Manhattan, is another gentleman, Sam Rosenberg. He's 81. He has been a florist for 65 years, doing the same thing at the same place, For that many years, same thing every day, you could say that, uh, you could say that these men are very, very faithful in what they do. You could say they're very, very devoted, or you could say they're committed, or you could say they're very religious about their enterprise. The same thing consistently, without fail, for years and years and years. Today... I'm going to talk about commitment. Today we're going to talk about devotion. Today we're going to talk about being faithful and to to be steady day in and day out, week after week, month after month, year after year in a different sense. It is a religious sense, but it is a religion that is a religion that the Father accepts. 
Some people talk about religion in, in different ways, and as a matter of fact, when we, when we bring up that word, you, see, you think of, of extremes. There are some people who would think about it this way, you know what, religion is dead, I'm about relationship, relationship is alive, I have a relationship with Jesus, I'm not about religion, and so they would be on one side, and then we know all over the world there are people who are very strict about their ritual, what they go through every week, even every day, and it's very important to them, and it's part of their relationship with God. We come to James chapter 1, we're at the end of this chapter, and we find that there is a religion that God accepts that is a faultless and pure religion. That's what we're talking about this morning. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater on one hand. On the other hand, we don't want it to become something it's not supposed to be. So we're talking this morning about pure religion. What does this pure, faultless, true religion look like that God accepts? And so what I thought I would do, a picture's worth a thousand words. And if we could show you a picture of true religion, we wouldn't really have to even go into a long sermon. And so we'll just show you the pictures, we'll get it done, and then we'll move on from there. So let's, let's look at a few pictures. First, let's take a look for our ladies. What does pure religion look like? There you go. Okay. So Sunday morning, if we can do that, we've got pure religion. For our men, let's go to the next. Something like this. You can't see that too well. And then our worship team. Let's look at that one. Okay. If we break out a few harps, I think we'll be good. There we go. Pure, faultless religion. No, it doesn't look like that at all. So we're in James chapter 1, verse 19. And there's something about religion that is deeper than looks. It goes on the inside, and James writes about it like this. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. I'm just going to stop there for a moment, and before we go on, I want to just highlight this. Notice this, that already what he's just talked about in those verses tells us that there's something, <coughs> excuse me, there's something external about our religion, something that's on the outside that people can see, but there's something inside that people can't see. It is both. It is, it is both. Verse 22, do not merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Verse 26 those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that, our, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Let's pray. Father, in the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray that the word, the living word of God would come inside of our hearts and that we would be transformed, Lord, without looking back, without turning back, that we would come alive to your word and, Lord, it would be like a, a strongly rooted tree in our souls. It, it would inform us and guide us every day and even today that we would respond to it as hearers and doers. That's our prayer. I pray that I would decrease, you'd increase, and you'd be so pleased today by the way we are truly hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So when life comes at you 100 miles an hour, what do you do? How do you act? How do you react? Well, James writes this, this letter to Christians who are going through trials. They're going and they're being tempted in every way. They're going through trials, they're being tempted, life is coming at them, they're being challenged. 
And how do you react and act when life comes at you in that way? You know the true colors of a person when they go through challenge. Not when things are good, but when they go through challenge. How do we come through that? That's when our true colors come out. And James is writing to them through these tests. Remember we said that the word for trial and the word for temptation is the same Greek word. When you go through the tests of life, how do we live? When we go through the tests of life, how do we act? When we go through the tests of life, what happens to our emotions and what comes out of our mouth? How do we live in those moments? And that's where James begins to turn this letter. What does pure religion, true religion look like? And before we talk about that, I want to talk about two things that it's not. Number one, it is not for show. Religion is not for show. It's not what is on the outside. We know that because of Jesus and his interactions with the, the, the lawyers of his day, some of the teachers of the law. They were the lawyers and they knew the law of Moses. They were experts in it. They knew it inside and out. And the Pharisees, these are religious leaders, and Jesus would interact with them and on, on one occasion in Matthew 23. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. He's, he's, he goes on to say, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. You've heard that expression, practice what you preach. It comes from Jesus and his words. They do not practice what they preach. Verse 4, it says, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And then in Matthew 23, verse 5, Jesus says, everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. Phylacteries are these boxes that they would wear either on their foreheads or on their arms. And inside those boxes there would be scripture verses. And they make them big so people can see them. Verse 6, they love the place of honor at the banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. In other words, they like to be called teacher. The Jews in Jesus' day even had an oral law. So they had the Torah, that is the written law of Moses, and then the, the rabbis, even hundreds of years before Jesus, began taking that law and interpreting it, and they would have an oral tradition. They would talk and pass down from one rabbi to another some principles about it, so they wanted to help interpret the, this written law, and they would pass these things down. And so along with the, the, you have the law of Moses, you also had all of these other rules and regulations and Jesus said they were heaping them on the shoulders of people so much so that it was weighing people down they themselves wouldn't even live according to that law he goes on later in Matthew 23 and he gives some examples one example is one of their rules was listen if you take an oath and you swear by the temple that that wasn't really something that would bind you but if you swore by the gold in the temple now you're bound to your oath it's crazy. Where did that come from? And so things like that were heaped upon people and they would not live them themselves. So they can't live there by the rules. They just want to look good. It's all about show. It's all about the outside. And we know for sure, we know beyond a doubt that the religion that the Father accepts is not something that is for show, that is just something to make people look a certain way. As a matter of fact, that kind of religion, Jesus even called them whitewashed sepulchers. They're like tombs. They're clean on the outside. On the inside, it's unclean. It is not what, what religion that God accepts is about. There's a second thing. It's not about helping God restore all things. You say, that's an interesting thing to, to put here when you talk about religion and you say what it is not. It's not about helping God restore all things. 
another way to say this is, is true religion isn't just getting all worked up and overly zealous and saying, oh, I can do this Christian thing, I can do this religious thing, and I'm going to work and serve and work till I can serve and work no more. It's almost as if we're trying to help God out in what he's doing. There was a group in Judea that began to become or gain popularity in the day of James, and they were called the Zealots. The Zealots, they were a group that wanted to or believed they needed to help clean up the world, clean up the world, make it a better place. And for, for them, that meant to help usher in Messiah who needed to come. And, and it looked very much like taking up arms, and that's what they did, and revolting and inciting violence against the Romans and, and trying in their own strength to kind of kick the Romans out and invite Messiah in. Well, their actions eventually led to the destruction of Jerusalem and James, as he's writing, is talking about the kinds of things that the, the zealots were trying to incite. James is saying these kinds of things are not the kinds of things that God wants. He doesn't want this anger. He doesn't want this, this, this type of behavior. He doesn't want this violence out of you. God's not looking for that out of you. He doesn't need you to help him in these ways. Zealots couldn't take things back and clean things up. And I say that because the church certainly can't do it either. Our job as a church is not to clean up the world. It's not to be clean and to help clean up the world. Our job is not to be right and help to make uh, other people right as if we can do it in our own strength and in our own efforts and in our own way we can help God because sometimes when that happens, our being right becomes self-righteousness and if we ever find ourselves getting perturbed or angry or self-righteous in our service, you know, I'm doing it and nobody else is. Come along and do what I'm doing and, and let's make a difference. Something inside of us is not right. It's not of, of God. And, and James begins to write against this kind of feeling. He says, that's not pure religion. I'm not saying that we don't, as a people, try to spread the truth what I'm saying is we can't do it in our own strength and our own zealousness. So instead, if it doesn't look like these two things, what does pure religion look like? And we're going to look at three things this morning quickly. And the first thing is this. What makes religion pure? Self-control. Self-control. When I was young, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 years old, I was visiting my father. My parents were divorced when I was very young, and so I went from Ohio to Illinois. I was visiting my dad, and, and uh, I was with my dad's wife, so my stepmom's mom, on this particular day. And my stepmom's mom was a farmer. She had livestock. She had uh, crops. And, and on this particular day, she... She needed help getting this little pig, this small pig, to the veterinarian because the pig was sick. And I had one job. This little 10-year-old boy, she was about to give me one job, and she said, no, you can't do this. And I said, yes, I can. She said, no, you can't do this. I said, I know I can do this. She said, okay, well, you need to take this pig and get it over to that truck and uh, there was a little good distance between where we were at and where we needed to go. And she said, and I'm going to hand you the pig, and you have to hold on to that pig. Because if you drop that pig, that pig might die. So don't drop the pig. That's simple enough. Grab the pig, hold on, go over to the truck and put it down. So I said, I can do this. She said, no, you can't. I said, yes, I can. She said, okay. She hands me the pig. Well, for the first five seconds, I had a death grip on that pig. And I began to walk, and I took, you know, a few steps, and I began to move forward. But all of a sudden, the pig lost control. And it started, and the pig was not greased. I know it's hard to grab a greased pig, but in this case, there was no grease on the pig. The pig began to, 
to, to move and squeal, and it was just began to lose control in my arms. And as the pig lost control, I began to lose control. And so I am squirming and trying to keep this pig off the ground because in my mind, all I hear is my step-grandmother telling me, if you drop that pig, it's going to die. And sure enough, I dropped the pig out on the ground, and I thought, life is over for me and the pig. She runs over, and she's a serious woman, and she is just all in a quandary, and she grabs that thing, takes it over to the truck, and I felt like a failure that day. I'm here to tell you the pig survived. Okay. <laughs> the pig survived. But sometimes, as we grow in Christ, what begins to happen is all around us, Sometimes life can begin to unravel. Things can begin to lose control. And sometimes when things around us start to lose control, we begin to lose control. And in the middle of that, in the middle of losing control, sometimes we lose, as people say, we lose our religion. Sometimes we lose it. And James is saying that one of the pieces or components of this acceptable religion, if you'll let me call it that, is this thing that, that, that we'll call self-control. Look at verse 19. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. He says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. This pure thing that God is, is talking about is something that is a place where we get to where we are good listeners. Before we before we begin to open up our mouths and tell other people why they're wrong, before we open our mouths and begin to shut down those around us or begin to come at those around us, God is saying something happens in the life of a believer where we grow to a place where we listen before we speak. We're slow to speak. Pure religion also looks like restraint because it says, and slow to become angry. What begins to happen? I'm not saying we're perfect or this happens every day, but we restrain ourselves. When this urge begins to rise up within us, we control it so before we get angry, we practice patience. And then he goes on. Verse 21, he says, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. Moral filth is just what it sounds like. It is, it is that, that ugliness, that dirtiness, that darkness that, that we can sometimes invite into our lives. He says, get rid of it. And this other word, evil, this has to do with all kinds of wickedness, but it also has to do with us having ill will toward other people. It's when we feel the wrong way about other people. We're looking at them in a way that's not healthy. We look at them in a way that's not good. And, and that is something that James says we're supposed to get rid of this. We remove it. Verse 27 says that we keep ourselves from being polluted by the world. It's a religion of heaven. Pure religion is a religion of heaven, not of this earth. It's, it's not of this world. It's, it's God's way, not our way. It's a higher way. It is not of the flesh. Your flesh might want to say something. Your flesh might want to lash out. Your emotions might want to be angry. But this is something that we do that is of heaven. It is of the spirit it's like Paul wrote in Galatians, we know it well. We learned it in, in, in children's church. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Start singing patience, <laughs> kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It ends with self-control. We control ourselves by the work of the Spirit in our lives and we are now walking in the way that God would have us to walk. It is a growth that happens within us. James 1.26, it also looks like our speech. Our speech is changing. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion, look, is worthless. When the horses want to run, the, when the horses 
of your emotions and the words that are about to come out of your mouth when they want to run, what does James do? Say that by, by our effort, we can rein in the words. It's not an easy thing to do. We're going to talk more about the tongue when we get to James chapter 3. But what does he say? Listen, there is something important about reining them back. You say, Eric, you don't know what it is my whole life. I lived under it when I was growing up. Now I'm doing the same things I couldn't stand. They happened to me when I was a kid. And, and now I'm doing it to my kids. I'm doing it to my spouse. I don't want to speak like that. I do it at work. I do it out with my friends. I don't know. I don't want to do that. Listen. By the power of the Spirit, you can prevail. God will give you a way. He won't tempt you beyond what you can bear. When the test comes, you can reign in the words. And powerful things will happen. Beautiful things. It's pure religion that God accepts. Number two, it's not just self-control. It is a desire to follow God's word. It is a desire to follow God's word. Look at verse 21. It says, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. And then it says, and humbly accept the word planted in you. It's like a seed. Many places the Bible talks about the word of God like a seed that gets planted and then it begins to grow. And here, this, notice this, the word of God is this word where it says it's planted in you. It's almost as if, past tense, the word of God is already there and now you're accepting what you already have received. You are deciding, I'm going to accept what God says. I'm going to accept. I know what it's right. You know, how many people do we know? None in this room, for sure. None of us. But how many people do we know who know the truth. They know what they should do. They know how they should live. They know what they should respond to. They know the gospel, but they don't respond. It is like a seed that's already planted. And here, what God is saying is we should humbly accept that seed of truth and let it begin to grow. So he says, get rid of all these things. It's an exchange. Do you see that? Get rid of the evil. And what do you replace it with? This word that's in you, which can save you. The beginning of this, this is, when we think about it, it's not just all these principles, but it is all of those, but where it starts is with the gospel. What is this seed that James is talking about? The core of it is the simple, true, powerful, profound message that Jesus forgives, Jesus saves, Jesus is the way It is the word of truth. That's what James said last week when we were in verse 18. It gives this birth. This word gives a a new birth. Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter 1. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter chapter 1. Here James is talking about it again. It is a word that is a word of truth. And it comes alive, this gospel, and it begins to grow. Look at verse 22. As this word grows, our desire for it should grow more. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. On Sunday morning, imagine you're on your way to church, you go to the mirror, you wake up, you go to the mirror, your hair looks like a rock star from the 80s. And then you walk away and get in the car and come to church, you do nothing about it. The mirror has just revealed that you have some work to do. The mirror has just revealed to you there's work in your life that you need to do before you before you go. But you forget it. You don't worry about it. You care nothing about it. You go to the mirror, you come home from what long you come home from work or you're out working in the yard and you, you just notice there's smudge of dirt all over your face. You look at it, you forget about it, then you go out to an important meeting. It wouldn't happen. The word of God, this desire to keep looking at it, it starts with the gospel and it begins to grow in our life and the desire goes deeper. And what James is saying is, listen, 
this is going to grow. And if it doesn't grow, if we don't desire this, if we're not now looking at that mirror every day and saying, oh, I see more clearly now. I know what you want now. And if we're not changing by that, we have a religion that is a false religion. That's what he says. There's something wrong. There's something not right. And so we are being encouraged through the word to let the word begin to shape and inform our lives. I want to emphasize, and we'll see this in James chapter 2. Listen, obeying these pieces and these components in the Bible does not save a person. Grace saves you. you. The grace of God, you accept it by faith in God. You believe and you're saved. That is it. Works can't do it. Paul's clear about it. The Bible's clear about it. But what does happen is when we're saved and we have true saving faith and the seed is in our life of the gospel begins to grow, all of a sudden now we have a desire and true saving faith leads a person to obey the word. If we don't have the works and the obedience to be more like Jesus, James will tell us when we get to James chapter 2, he'll say, listen, if you didn't have it uh, there, or I'm sorry, if you don't have it in your walk, you didn't have it at the beginning because real saving faith will change the way you desire to be more and more like Jesus. And so pure religion comes with this wonderful desire. Matthew 7 verse 24, Jesus says these amazing things about following the word of God. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. On the rock. You want your life to be strong. You want your kids' lives to be strong. You want your family to be strong. You're hearing this word. You're obeying this word. You're getting founded and established in the, in the rock. Nothing can come against you. But those who just have an appearance, what happens? Their house, it says later in that same passage, comes down with a great crash. It doesn't just say a crash, it says a great crash. So true religion is about this desire for the word of God, number two, and then number three, it's about compassion for those in need. I'm going to invite someone to come and play quietly if they would. Compassion for those in need. Perhaps this is the quintessential piece to being a person who is pleasing to the Father in the way we live out our lives as believers. There are many people who serve make a distinction and say there are many people all around the world who go overseas, people who give of their money. As a matter of fact, I've read studies that atheists and agnostics have a higher level of compassion than even evangelicals. That doesn't mean that evangelicals don't serve and give and so on. Evangelicals have the highest component in turn when it comes to, to the place of how much we give and how we serve and give our time and so on. But in terms of just that feeling of compassion, like why did you help? Why did you give? Why did you do it? Our level of that empathy isn't as high. There are studies that say that atheists and ag agnostics have a much higher level. Maybe, our, maybe an evangelical's reason is doctrine or just the, there's some other reason, but the point is this, that there are people all around the world who don't know Jesus, who are giving of their time, they're serving, they're loving, they're doing all they can to make a difference. And so then here comes the Christ follower and does the same thing, and how are we different? There are two things that are very different. We just talked about them and they're so important. Number one, 
when the Christ follower gives a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus, and when the Christ follower visits someone in prison in the name of Jesus, and when the Christ follower is there giving food to a hungry person in the name of Jesus, number one, when that Christ follower leaves and goes home or goes out later with their friends, that Christ follower is remembering that there is a spirit that is alive and living inside of them, that they're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and they're living lives outside of that that are pure and true and have integrity no matter where they're at. They're, they're a person who has the, the Spirit's power to have self-control. The second thing, and perhaps the most important, is that that Christ follower has a desire for that that beautiful seed of the Word of God that's growing inside of them. And so that, that person, when they're out there giving a cup of cold water and feeding the hungry and visiting the sick and those in prison, now all of a sudden that same gospel that's alive and, and well and that same hunger for the Word of God is something that they can't just contain and they're sharing it. And so as they're handing the cup of cold water and they're, they're handing out the food, they're saying, listen, there's something deeper. There's a bread that, 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 and a water that I want to give you and it'll make it so you're never hungry again and I, and I want it so you're never thirsty again and that person who's a Christ follower is now giving something even more that's eternal. But it still comes back to the fact that we are not exempt in the kingdom of God for having a heart of love and compassion and the religion that the Father accepts. Look with me in verse 27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Listen, this is an active compassion that seeks to make a difference. To look after means you're going to look upon someone, you're going to see how they're doing, and you're actively engaged. You want to know what it's like. It's not just passive. Oh, okay, you're not doing well. Okay. It is active, let me help. It's powerful. And at the end of days, at the end of days, there's going to be a dividing that takes place. At the end of days, there's going to be a dividing that takes place. Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 25. It's a dividing of the sheep and the goats. And the interesting thing is, the sheep and the goats were feeling all together, perhaps like they were one unit, but Jesus talks about them as being divided along certain lines. And those who are condemned will wonder what they did not do, and those who are commended will wonder what they did do. And Jesus, in Matthew 25, verse 37, says, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? In Matthew 25, 40, the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. When we serve people in need, we serve Jesus. When we serve people in care, this pure religion, we're serving Jesus. Jesus. We're serving the Savior. True religion is not about how much theology we know. True religion is not about how much money we have to give. It's not about how much education we have. It doesn't matter if you were born on that side of the tracks or that side of the tracks or this side of town or in that country or that community. It is no respecter of class or status or race. No one is, is set apart. It is for everyone this, this pure, true, heavenly pursuit that James talks about. The best example I can give you is a story that you might have read. There's a woman who for years sent us a letter every month. Her name is Edith or she goes by Eddie. As far as I know she's, she's well into her 80s now. For years and years and years, every month, to hundreds of missionary kids, and then as they became adults, to those adult 
missionary kids that grew up into their families and missionary families into the kids of missionary families she would send out newsletters with with toys and trinkets for the kids every month without fail hundreds of these letters so and we called her aunt eddie aunt eddie and uh she told a story when she was 14 this happened to her she was 14 years old 1946 and her father had passed away a few years before so it's just after world war ii seven kids in the family some of the older ones are, are married there's still some younger ones and then there were three daughters that were kind of in the middle years she was 14 years old one day at church they went to a small church they lived about a mile away from church they would walk to church one day at their church the pastor got up and said listen in a month uh, for Easter we're gonna take up an offering we're gonna bless a family there's a needy a poor family we're gonna bless that family everybody do their part and get ready on Easter we're gonna take up that offering we're gonna make this difference they were so excited they got home they began to plan for that month they ate basically potatoes they didn't they didn't splurge at all on food they didn't have much money at all but they ate just the bare minimum so they could save on some of their food money they made those cotton loop pot holders they would sell three of those for a dollar and they were trying to make those and sell those to make money so they could give in the offering they wouldn't play the radio they like to listen to the radio they wouldn't play the radio to save electricity so they could have more money to give in the offering and what would be like a fortune to them they gathered up and on Easter they had seventy dollars so the mom put ten in the offering each of the girls put twenty in the offering they were so excited later that afternoon the pastor came to their house and said we wanted to give you an offering and gave a hundred dollars to their family they were the family they went from feeling like this to feeling we're the poor family we're the family for a week they were in, in the doldrums but next Sunday came time for church and mom is it was raining mom is getting the lady the, the, the children ready the children don't want to go they don't want to face anybody they do not want to go mom says we're gonna go so they go and they walk make their way to church and that morning there was a missionary and the pastor said we need to take up an offering for the missionary so let's do our best and it was like a it was like a light bulb they knew what they were to do so they took their money they gave in the original offering 70 they got back around a hundred that day from the pastor they took to church they took to church that day uh, 87 of those dollars and they put 87 dollars in the offering for the the missionary the rest of the church put just a little bit more so it was just over a hundred dollars that missionary found out that morning that they were giving him a hundred dollars the missionary said wow I did not expect this you must have a rich family in this church and those people that wonderful family who felt just so down realized no they were they were up here God had lifted them up again it's a powerful story of what I want to call pure, true, faultless religion that the Father accepts. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. In a moment, we're going to pray for our church. Just that the the the. the